previously on your favorite episode. And, and that's the episode where we where we learn that Ned Flanders has a unusually large penis. Hello and welcome to a brand new edition of your favorite episode. I am your host Jackie and joining me today is my partner and producer Mickey. Our guest today is a comedian with possibly the best opening bit of all time. I know him as Mandel, but his parents call him Tevin. And today he's here with us to talk about his favorite episode of television ever. And honestly, I'm like super excited about this one. It's uh, season two, episode 14 of SpongeBob SquarePants, Frankendoodle. Y'all ready to get into it? Let's go. TV rocks your brains. (laughs) That's absurd. TV only softens the brain like a ripe banana. Television. Much of our future depends on the way we use this medium of communication. Are you ready, kids? Aye, aye, Captain! I can't hear you! Aye, aye, Captain! Oh! Eventually, your favorite episode will be filmed in front of a live studio audience. But for now, let's talk about good old SpongeBob SquarePants with uh, Atlanta comic Mandel. Thank y'all for having me. Thank y'all for having me. We're the- so excited to have you because you're the only person I know that is obsessed with Waffle House as much as I am. I am. And you know something, too? I'm really excited to be on this specifically because I met y'all at my first festival I ever did. Really? Oh, that, I that didn't was, know that. Yeah. Okay, so was that that was uh Orlando Comedy Orlando, uh, Orlando Indie. Indie Comedy Fest. Yeah. Uh, what year were you there? That had to it was the last year, so mm-hmm. was that 18 or 17? Was it 18? I think, I think so. it was 18. I think that's what I did on the graphics. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep, so it was me. That was my first festival. And a lot of comedians who are way more successful than me. <laughs> first, first, I was just with the, I was in, I was just came back to Atlanta from um, Los An- Angeles, but I don't know if y'all remember Allie Makovsky. Yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That was her first, first festival, too. We were talking oh, about. Oh, damn. That. Yeah, that same year. And um, Ishmael was there and Janelle James. Yes. Emmy nominated Janelle James. I opened up for her at that festival. You did, you did Let's Play a Game, a comedy game for Janelle James. Yes, I oh did. Oh my God. It was like so many people who was at that Orlando festival who are like doing crazy stuff now. So that just yeah. hit in my heart. Yeah. It was a good, that was a good time. That was a good year. And we got to meet so many cool people. We met you. We met, um, Hunter Roberts, who's like stayed with us a couple times since the Orlando Indie Comedy Fest. Yeah. Um, and then my brain forgets everybody else that exists on earth when I have to make a list. So those are the only two people I remember right now. Well, yeah. we, we hung out. Uh, Danny and, and Tyler stayed with us for a yes. little bit. Holly Lene uh, stayed Holly with Lene. us for a bit. Yeah. Um, Holly Lene. Um, t- uh, Tim, Mur- Tim Murphy. Is he still out there? Yeah. He, he's like... He's like my adopted brother. We had a lollipop company together. Or we, I guess we still do. We just live in separate places now. We so we don't sell them as much. But yeah, he is he's he's on TikTok. He's doing really well on TikTok now as Uncle Big Tim. Yeah, I see Heather Shaw does really well too. Wait, yeah. she was just like Jim Carrey. He had the uh what's it called? She does like the stuff about Jim Carrey that don't mm-hmm. really funny. But Tim, I remember Tim had these bottles. I don't know if I'm too off track right now. No, 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 no you're fine. <laughs> but, we just but, use the television show as a way to talk about things that are fun. So you're I remember good. in Orlando, we was in Orlando, and that man Tim was we was we was in uh we was outside the party, and mm-hmm. he had these various axes and knives, <laughs> and. He was doing this thing where he was 
popping bottles by cutting it, swiping it with an axe. And I was like, man, this is such a Florida stereotype. <laughs> Just unnecessarily, like so much can go wrong <laughs> for such a small task. And I was having such a great time. <laughs> we, it was literally on the back of a pickup truck. He lifted up this, this like a uh, sheet. And it was just various weapons. <laughs> and he was using them to cut open his bottles. And I was like, what are we, why? But it was so fun. I was having a great time. It was great. There were the people, funny there... thing is, that's not the only time Tim has done that. <laughs> well, for or the fourth or fifth or sixth or seventh even. <laughs> man, that was a good time. I was like, man, this is some real, like, this Florida. This, this, is, this is what they say Florida is. Also, <laughs> I had my first heartbreak at the Orlando Indie Fest. Because Aww. when I came down there, I came because I found out the Blue Man group was there. And that's when I found out that it's multiple blue men. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was one band of dudes <laughs> painted blue going around the country. But I saw that they had a show at the same time as the Las Vegas one. <laughs> and I was like, what is happening here? This is a corporation. <laughs> And that really hurt my feelings, man. I I was I always wanted to be one of the blue men, but it's like I actually could be if I was in the right weight and height range and could play the drums. I think they should let anybody be a blue man. Yeah, it doesn't matter if they all look like the same dude, you know. Right. Uh, but it's a great show. Yeah, I saw. I got to see it in Boston in oh, early two thousands, like two. I think it was like two thousand one or something like that that I got to see Blue Man Group. Well, no, yeah, it was right after uh, right after nine eleven. So right oh. around the time this show came out. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh wow. <laughs> okay. Anyway. So let's put put me into like where you were the first time you saw this episode of television. Like, right. oh, let me just say we it's SpongeBob SquarePants, which is very exciting to me because I watched it obsessively with my child as she was growing up, and it's season two, episode fourteen, and we're focusing on the second half, Frank and Doodle, the one with Doodle Bob, the terrifying pencil guy. Yeah, so I would have to say, so what year, this year was, the year of this was? January 2002. 2002. 2002. So I am in elementary school. And so I remember the first time I saw SpongeBob, the first episode was the Rip His Pants one, right? Mm -hmm. And I remember, I just remember it kind of shaped my sense of humor a little bit. Because I was like, man, this is, um, I feel like children's shows before, some, most of them kind of had, were making some overall point mm-hmm. about life or, or or trying to like teach a lesson of some sort to be a good person. Mm-hmm. But SpongeBob is the first show I remember out of all of those where it was just dumb. <laughs> like it, purely, it purely was just. This is entertaining. This is some dumb, entertaining stuff to put mm-hmm. on television. And I remember the Doodle Bob one being so funny because it was like, because, you know, that was the first time I seen them do the thing where they take, like, the real life element and throw it into the cartoon. Yeah, yeah. The real pencil come down. And then we went to elementary. We was, I remember after that episode, everybody was going around school doing the, um, the Doodle Bob voice. <laughs> <laughs> you know can you do it still i tried before the before i logged in and i did a bad job but like the, <laughs> when he was doing the like uh it was, it was a part, i watched it the episode again last week it's a part i believe somebody was talking about when he's trying to explain something the doodle bob mm-hmm. and they're like what did you say who was talking to was it patrick i think so it was somebody he was talking to where he's like repeating something over and over again. And that specific part we used to repeat all the time. <laughs> so funny. And then I was like a SpongeBob fanatic from that point on for maybe like all the way through middle school. Yeah. I, I think memorizing everything. I think I still watched it with my kid when she was in high school. Like I don't think but I think she probably still watches it, honestly. It's the best cartoon. I think out of I think for maybe like, uh, I, I'll say maybe like 
if I could name all my favorite cartoons over the years, I think that has to be at least number one or two. It's like, really good. All time. It's so good. So what, what else is in the same class? That's a great question. I think, because like, hmm. I think I think it's up there with like the like if you even if you name Looney Tunes, mm. I mm-hmm. think it's up there with that in the sense because like it's so many you saw how so many sh- shows after that tried to shape themselves after that. Yeah, mm-hmm. wasn't a great example. If you go back and watch SpongeBob episodes now, not just this one but all of them, when you go back, it's like man, this is still as funny as you remember. But if you go back and watch Fairly Odd Parents, <laughs> it's really bad. It's really, Fairly Odd Parents in particular is really manic to watch for me. Yeah. It's yeah. so, it's like they're on all the time, full volume, always. Yeah, it's really bad. The jokes are not as good. Like, Mm-mm. I went back on, I know I'm kind of off topic, couples be talking about Doodle Bob, but in SpongeBob in general, mm-hmm. I went back and watched the, um, it's a SpongeBob episode where Mr. Krabs goes to hang out with Patrick and SpongeBob. <laughs> and they go on a they go on a panty raid. What? You know what I'm talking about? I this don't is, remember this at all. This is, this is my second favorite episode. <laughs> so they go on a panty raid and then they sneak into this lady's house to get her panties and it's Mr. Krabs' mom. <laughs> And so they're like, what is happening? So then after that, they go to a a, 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 a washer, like a, a, why I can't think of this word. They go to a cleaner's place. They go to a, a and then they. Dry cleaner? Dry, no, not a dry cleaner. Uh, why I can't, this is a simple word. <laughs> My brain does that all dryer. the time. A place with washer and dryers in. Oh, laundromat. Laundromat. Why I can't get that out, but. They go to the laundromat and they doing spin cycles and Patrick and SpongeBob are like acting like they tripping on LSD. Where they're like, ooh, the colors, this is wild. This is crazy, man. And then Mr. Krabs is like, that's it, y'all are late. And then they start crying. And it's like that those jokes, those jokes I saw as a kid and I thought was funny. But then as an adult, I watch again, then it's like, now it's even funnier because I have better <laughs> context of yeah. what they was to do. You get what I'm saying? And yeah. so that's what I feel like that's what makes that show so good. I think what makes a good cartoon is something that's entertaining the children, but also to the parents as well. Yeah, yeah. That was one of I liked watching SpongeBob with my kid because it didn't it was never grating on me or it never got like annoying. It was always in, in, entertaining and enjoyable to watch. Yeah. For yeah, people who have like zero idea what SpongeBob even is, could you explain a little bit about the show, like the the idea of it, like the main characters? Yeah. So the SpongeBob is a sponge, <laughs> <laughs> and the, so essentially what it is, it's a dude who's a single dude with a cat, but it's a snail, and he <laughs> works at a and he works at a fast food restaurant. For a greedy boss and his best friend is really, really dumb. <laughs> and his other new neighbor is this squirrel who's a scientist from out of town. And then his other neighbor is this dude named Squidward who doesn't really like him, but he doesn't know it yet because he's socially inept. <laughs> and, um, what he pretty much do is really about somebody who just enjoys their life. Mm-hmm. Very simple. He doesn't have... Like, it's one of the few characters that doesn't have, like, a ambitious goal. Like, he really just liked going to work and having a fun time with his friends. Yeah. All the other characters are the ones with the goals. You know, like... Um, Mr. A Plankton wants to take over the world. <laughs> he want to take over the world. Uh, Mr. Crab want the money. Squid will want to be an artist. And he mm-hmm. just really just kind of enjoying whatever adventures come along with his world. And it's really interesting because the dude who created the show, um, he was like a marine biologist. Yeah, like he, I read that he created these characters like way, way, way long time ago in a book that he wrote. Yeah, he was a marine biologist and it's it's very, it's very interesting because you see how like, it's very interesting because you see how like 
he all his specific knowledge about this one thing created this big old thing. Like, I don't think that dude can make a different cartoon. Oh no. You get what I'm saying? Like, yeah. It's just like little stuff. Like I, I remember one time I tried to write a spec script for a SpongeBob, <laughs> and I realized I don't have enough ocean knowledge. Yeah, because a lot of the jo- jokes, like I didn't like what plankton. I just don't offhand have an idea of plankton. Yeah, and, and things stuff like you know what I mean. Yeah, so the, the show is great though, man. I mean that episode is great. The dude, the pencil, the magic pencil comes down. And then he draws himself and then he's <laughs> fighting against his alter ego. It's, it's really the first multiverse. It's really, they really <laughs> did Marvel before Marvel where they had himself fighting himself. He tried to erase himself but leaves an arm. He draws himself and he realized to get rid of him, he had to put him on paper. Like, that is great. Like, whoever wrote that is obviously a why they wrote, wrote one of the greatest shows of all time, you know? <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, it's it's a really layered finale to the episode, I think, the way that they came up with how to end it. And Mickey, did, wasn't there something interesting about the rock, paper, scissors at the beginning? Yeah, like, yeah. It, like um, SpongeBob is a silly, silly cartoon, but when you really dig in deep, there are um, really well-crafted aspects of storytelling. Uh, like at the beginning of the episode, uh, we see, um, so we have, uh, we open up on, uh, SpongeBob and Patrick playing rock, paper, scissors in the bubbles and Patrick always chooses paper and Squidward points out, he's like, well, why, why do you always choose paper? And that, and paper ends up being what wins at the end of the show. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't even I didn't even connect that dot when I watched it, but that is real. Yeah, they <laughs> were rock paper scissors get kept it with thick of paper, and then papers were won. I mean, bro, it, it, it's it's phenomenal. It's interesting because I chose the Doodle Bob episode because that was a episode I fell in love with. But I, I just think about so many of the episodes of that show where you like, man, like um, the one when the health inspector come through and, and he had they had that really nasty burger. <laughs> I like some of the repeated bits in SpongeBob, like the fact that he struggles so hard to get his driver's license. Yes. Yes, that's I love that. I love the my leg dude. Oh, oh yes. <laughs> he when just it, fucking randomly shows up. Off screen. And honestly, I think SpongeBob has some of the best fictional land music, like the Goofy Goober song. Oh, for sure. The Goofy Goober, the um the ripped his pants. Sweet yep. victory, um, uh, 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 the fun song. I if forgot about that one. You, you and me, that song is great. The weirdest thing, the now I'm thinking about when y'all mentioned the SpongeBob. The weirdest thing I think about now is that um, a lot of I feel like people my age specifically, like maybe like uh, what I don't know. I guess millennials. SpongeBob is a part of our culture and ecosystem. Mm-hmm. Like on Twitter, people can put memes of just screenshots of SpongeBob, and it don't even need the words. And people uh, get the rest. <laughs> you know okay, what I'm saying? So when I was researching this sh- the this episode, because I am a dork and I do like all kinds of research because I'm I'm I like I'm interested in things. I found this phenomenon on Reddit that I have found no explanation for. So this episode in particular, if you go into certain rappers subreddits, there are instances where people will just throw this episode as a post. And then there's like, is there some kind of significance to this episode in the rap community that I don't know about? Cause I don't understand this phenomenon. Hmm. I don't, I don't know that reference. I don't know. I, I have, I'm, I'm gonna look that up. I don't know. I don't know. It is. It was because I. It was the weirdest thing that I I noticed researching this because I would just search prank and doodle Reddit and it just came up in all of these rap communities. I'm like, what is happening? I do not understand. It's probably it's probably some joke somebody made. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. Yeah, I, but I I don't know the reference. I'm pretty sure it may have something to do. Usually, when it's something like that, some. It happened like some battle rapper said something real cool that involved that, and then now people reference that. 
the ones I can think of are like, for instance, there's this picture of, it's a small picture in the episode. It doesn't matter that much. <laughs> but it's an episode, it's Mr. Krabs in like a whirlwind. Mm-hmm. Like it's right when the camera's about to start spinning. That's a huge meme on Twitter. Whenever somebody's like confused or like whenever they're showing somebody like in a position where maybe they're about to get beat up or something, mm-hmm. they post that meme and then they just blow up, man. <laughs> it just blow up. That junk is... um. It's great, man. It's a great television program. I love that episode. I feel like, now that I'm thinking about it, bro, I, I, I feel like it's other episodes I could have picked, too. It's it, <laughs> Like, I asking other people to answer this question is is really mean, because they, I don't think I could answer it. Like, great example, <laughs> a, an episode that has had an impact on my adult life is when Squidward moved to that gated community. <laughs> Did you ever see that episode? No, I didn't. It was an episode where he got into this, he finally got into this gated community with uh, other squids. <laughs> and so he would do these dance classes and he, it, the whole episode was about him trying to get into it. Mm-hmm. But once he get into it, he's doing everything. Like, he getting canned bread for some reason. He liked canned bread. <laughs> <laughs> He was like getting cambred. He kept going to tango classes. He went to clarinet class. And they show him over time doing this over and over and over again. And then eventually he loses his mind and goes back to the house he was in. And it was just weird thing where he like all he wanted was to have peace and quiet to be normal mm-hmm. with other people like him. And then he kind of learned like, oh, I actually enjoy the chaos of the world. You know, <laughs> instead of the monotony of the things that I thought I wanted. Yeah. And I think about that now where it's like, you know, working corporate jobs or whatever. Then I started doing stand up. And, you know, at first it's like, dang, you know, I, I, I'm i not making as much money or whatever. But then it's like, I, you know, I enjoy this. I enjoy yeah. the, you know, the non monotony of whatever I, my life is, you know. Uh, near the beginning, well, I guess midway through the quarantine part of the pandemic, um, I made the decision to quit my job that I'd been at for six years and go freelance. And there is zero way I could go back to working in a corporate job, oh, like sure. zero. There's no yeah. way. Like now that I, like one of the journeys that I went on was like valuing myself and my time and stuff. And now that I do that, nobody else is going to value it as much as I will. So why would I want to work for anybody else? <laughs> it's kind of it's very difficult to like sit down and and tell people this because you know i i grew up listening to you know don't uh watching all the movies of people that you know gave themselves to a company and then at the end the company was like well see ya and it's i went through that during you know during the pandemic uh, uh you know after you know almost 20 years with a company they were like well see ya and so it was, you know, I don't know any, what everyone else went through for the pandemic, but for us, it was, it was all those lessons that we learned basically that we kind of stacked up. We'll like, well, we'll get to the, we'll get to those lessons in a bit. Like during the pandemic, all of them came home and it was like, oh, now that's what my parents were talking about. That's what the cartoons were talking about. That's what, you know, all those movies and television shows that, that I watched growing up were talking about. It's like, uh, you have to enjoy your life, you know, work to live, don't live to work, basically. Mm-hmm. 100%. I, I mean, for me, um, it's, I, I feel like I had the the other side of that experience where I started doing stand-up uh, in 2016, right after I graduated. And so I was working at, um, I was working at, I was working at like AT&T corporate or mm-hmm. whatever. And I started doing stand-up and then it was rough because, you know, I'm working like a full-time job and I'm doing stand-up every night. So it's like, really, it's really weird. I don't think I could do it now, but like getting like four hours of sleep every night. Yeah. And it was really rough. And then eventually around 2019, I finally started doing colleges. And then I started making uh, more money than I ever made in my life. And then the <laughs> pandemic hit. Yeah. Maybe six months after I quit my job. Oh. And I had no 
more gigs. So March 2020, I was staying in a friend's with a friend in New York. I'm about to sign a lease the next week. And then just cancel emails, just come down. Oh. So then I had to move back to Atlanta. Um, and then I'm like, dang, I should have stayed at work. And then I started going back to, and then I started, you know, working again and different stuff like that. And I was like, oh man, this still kind of trash. <laughs> <laughs> like, even with all this, <laughs> even as broke as I am, this is still <laughs> very, very unenjoyable. And so now I have found that happy medium where it's like, you know, I can finally, I can work and stuff too. But I still make sure I take the effort to, uh, you know, make value out of things that are valuable to me, pretty much. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So I got to say, I keep thinking about the point that you made about SpongeBob earlier, and I don't know why I never thought about this before, but it really is a good lesson for kids to grow up with to just be happy in your life. Yeah. Because yeah, everything sure. else is showing people that aren't happy with what they have and always struggling to get more. <laughs> But SpongeBob was just happy being SpongeBob. And that's a fucking great lesson to learn. And it makes me happy that my kid hopefully learned it when watching. Totally. Totally. I I think that was the first show I've seen like that where he kind of, he never really wanted more. Like he truly enjoyed going to work, being a fry cook. He wanted to be the best fry cook he could be. Mm -hmm. He enjoyed hanging on. So all the adventures were either he was sent on a mission or he was uh, just a part of some mischief that might have happened. But he never really was like a person where he felt like without, you know? Yeah. And I think a lot of times people get punished in in like corporate environments when they're happy at their job. Like if, like if you're a fry cook and you're happy being a fry cook and you don't want to be anything else, like there's always a pressure to move up the ladder. And yeah. in the real world and... I yeah, like to, to eliminate that, maybe like let people just be happy where they are and make money enough to live. Yeah, I think you know, I feel like a lot of times, I mean, and it's a big thing with stand ups, man. We always, uh, we always are trying to find something on stage that we really got to find within ourselves, man. And so, <laughs> well, and like, so, um, most, most people that I've talked to said, uh, doing stand up comedy is. The, some of the best therapy that they can go through. Although sometimes it can be very bad if you, if you uh, go down the wrong uh, sure. rabbit hole, so to yeah. speak. But for sure. I think it's a very, obviously I enjoy it. It's fun and it's definitely like helpful to like, you know, uh, tell stories and people relate to them or find them entertaining. But I do think also you, whatever internal work, as far as like them climbing up the ladder of stand up and, you know, I, I, I tell I say this all the time. It's really I really enjoy stand up, and I'm really grateful for any forward mobility I have because I'm asking a lot of people. <laughs> like I'm asking people to pay me to listen to me talk about exactly what I want, <laughs> not even what they want to talk about. <laughs> I'm I'm saying I want you to give me money to listen to me talk about what I decided I want to talk about. And In a so, world yeah. where it's hard just to get people to listen to you. Exactly. <laughs> and so then for me it's like whatever if it's one person who enjoys that, if one person comes to a show or 10 or 100 or if one if I get asked to do this thing or whatever, I'm always just grateful for that cuz it's like this is a this is a hard ask, you know. <laughs> uh, even even when you go to a concert, they playing the songs you already like. Yeah. So and people know. get mad if they don't. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so mad. So it's it's uh, I mean it, I don't know it's, it's 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 cool I love it but um sorry to get off topic I be I I, I get uh that's I, I ramble but I am yeah, that episode well. is real good I um I will say that I will say my um. My only beef with SpongeBob in general is I feel like in the newer episodes, I went back and started watching because I didn't know that they still write it. Mm-hmm. So like maybe like the last couple seasons, it seems like the the they got it to the point where SpongeBob and Patrick are like 
incoherently dumb now. Oh, really? When mm. it wasn't like that before. No. Like, I feel like <laughs> I feel like Patrick was kind of dumb and Spongebob was a little naive. Mm-hmm. But now they're both like just, just unbelievably like unrealistically dumb. Mm-hmm. And it kind of ruins the nuance of what I remember the show being. Yeah, I, I think um, like there we did uh, two episodes back to back on uh, Simpsons, and both episodes that were chosen were from season eight, which was um, by most accounts the peak of the Simpsons, and everything since then has been a downward slide. But it's it's kind of like the photocopy of a photocopy because uh, SpongeBob is in what twenty two years now, um, yeah. so the kids or I, I don't want to use the word kids as a demeaning term, but the, the people that are old enough now to be writers on the show are people that grew up watching it. Yeah. And so it's like, they still have that childhood memory of SpongeBob, who was right. this silly, goofy thing. And so they're interpreting like in the early, early seasons, you know, they're still creating and learning and asking the questions of what would SpongeBob do in this situation? We don't know. Let's, walk down and figure this out where the kids that are writing it now already have a picture in their mind. They're like, Oh, he's just going to be dumb because that's, that's what point. I remember. That's a great point. Yeah. I didn't even think about it like that. Cause if I, if I, if I consume SpongeBob when I was younger, I have a, I have a, I have a thought process of how it made me feel. Mm-hmm. And so then I'm a, I'm a create based off that rather than the person who was originally making it. Cause didn't someone didn't the one of the writers pass away? Yes, the creator, I think, Stephen Hillenburg is passed away. Yeah. I'm pretty sure. Yeah. And so I think like it's like you said, over time, then I'm kind of going based off how it made me feel rather than how the original artists kind of were making the product. Yeah. You know? He passed um, away yeah, in 2018. He died 2018. Oh wow. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I had I remember hearing that. Yeah, that 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 show, but that show for me and for most people my age is the is the best cartoon. I don't think anybody tell you unless only only ones that people tell you above that is if they like an anime person. The only yeah. I think if I asked my kid, she would say Rugrats. Rugrats is a good time. Rugrats was a great time. Um, I felt like uh, Rugrats was really good, but. Um, I felt like I, f- I feel like Rugrats was it's it's a little ch- I ain't gonna lie I watched the Rugrats was one of the few cartoons mm-hmm. or, or children's shows where the where the where the reboot wasn't that bad the all I haven't watched up, it yet all grown up when they yeah. were uh, like teenagers it was I'll actually alright it. It, it was Can pretty I, the, thing, the thing I liked about Rugrats I think that they had some fully realized characters on a kid's show. And you don't see that very often. Like yeah. even the parents, I think were fully realized characters. Like the kids all had full personalities. The parents all had their own personalities and they weren't just like caricatures. They were actual characters. And I love that about that show. Definitely. My favorite, my favorite, uh, my favorite movie experience. One of my favorite movie experiences is when we saw the Rugrats movie <laughs> as a kid. I took and my I kid to see that. She's, uh, I think, two years younger than you. So you guys are like the same generation. So that's why I keep yeah. referencing her. I saw that. The, Reg- the Rugrats movie was fantastic. Mm-hmm. They went to, I think they went to Paris. Yep, Rugrats go to Paris. Yeah, and Chucky's dad had got the girlfriend. Mm-hmm. They added her daughter to the cast after that. Susie, that was- right? Susie. I think that was her name. Yeah, he had because he met some lady in Paris, and then then when the episode after that, they had the new daughter that was involved mm-hmm. in the cast. Yep, I remember that. That that was a good movie. Um, yeah, Rugrats is great. I think, but I think um, it's a lot of good ones, man. But I think that's definitely it's so many funny moments. Like when they, you could go up to anybody my age. And, and say, is mayonnaise an instrument? And that's exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> but, 
I know I'm talking. Did, did y'all see the episode? I don't think so. In a, the episode when they was playing the bubble ball, they had a band. Mm-hmm. And Squidward was trying to have band practice. And they started playing, and nobody knew how to play play any instrument. And then Patrick raised his hand, and he's like, yes, Patrick. And then Patrick's like, is mayonnaise an instrument? <laughs> and then Squidward was, was so frustrated with him. And it was so funny. It was so funny. Frustrated Squidward is the literal best. Yeah, it was great. It was so funny. Yeah, I, um, I think, but yeah, I, I, now that I'm thinking about it, I feel like now that I'm actually thinking about it, I probably, Doodle Ball was probably my first favorite, but now it's like other ones that I do think. <laughs> <laughs> it's, hard, it's hard to pick a favorite. It is. It's really hard. What is the first thing you would draw with a magic pencil? If I could have it. That's a great question. I, you know, I used to think about if I had a green lantern ring a lot, um, which is I feel like the kind of similar same concept. Well, maybe yeah. not because it don't stick around. But if I could draw, hmm, you know, something I would draw it, it, immediately. I would draw a desk to put this computer on. <laughs> <laughs> right now, this this computer is sitting on a drawer of mine, and I realize I might be a little too old for that. <laughs> so I would definitely draw me a desk to put my computer on. Um, what else would I draw? What was the first thing they draw? Do you remember? I don't remember. I don't remember. I the jellyfish. Was... That's right. It's yes, jellyfish. they did. Yep, they drew the jellyfish with it. And then, which basically triggers a, 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 a few co- uh, seconds of uh, fantastic wordplay. Um, because Patrick basically says it's not a very good drawing, and then then he follows up by saying it's coming alive, and uh, SpongeBob's like, "Yes, now you get it," and then you know, it's like, "No, it's really coming to life." Yeah, yeah, I remember that part. That's funny. Yeah, I would draw. Like, I I think also I would draw. Um, I wonder if you could. I, I would say draw money, but I don't think they would take the black and white money. I'm pretty sure I would probably start off by drawing some sort of food. Oh, that's a good idea. That's a good idea. I always think like in animated movies and like stop motion movies, the food always looks so good. So if I get a chance to try a food that I drew with my own hand, I want to do it. (laughs) For sure. For sure. Especially like anime movies, like they fool us. They do a good job of like making like the food look real. Mm -hmm. Um, but like they'll be having something that I just I wouldn't even cons- I don't even know what you would buy that at. Yeah. Know? Um, for sure, for sure. I, I what what would you draw, Mickey? Um, I don't know. I I don't know if I'd go for practical or try to cash out. I I mean, I would probably like if I had an immediate need, I would go with that. But I would try the cash thing because. Yeah. Eventually, someone's going to take the pencil away, or the pencil's going to break. So you got to kind of maximize the use. All right, I got a question. How much you think that that pencil is worth? Oh, that's a good question. Underwater, probably a lot, but above water, like ten cents. But I'm saying, let's say if the pencil can do what it does underwater in real life. Oh, oh, oh! Like put it in a real life situation, not. Outside yeah, the like confines could, of the show. You could draw stuff and it comes, let's say if you draw and it's like a 3D printer. There is something like that exists already. Really? Yeah, my friend Tanisha has it. I forget what it's called. I don't think it worked that great though. Yeah, it was like a 3D doodler or something like that yeah. where you could draw, like basically could, it was just uh, a pen that leaks out uh, plastic, melted yeah. plastic. <laughs> so you just kind of stretch it up. But, um, yeah, I, I I I think it would be uh you couldn't calculate the value of it if you yeah. were able to use it right and like again the money if you could draw money on the ground and then pick it up and pay for your dinner I mean it's it's endless the the value yeah. of it is endless yeah yeah because I'm thinking like let's say if you could draw objects but it's not like it's not a thing that comes to life like it's like like if I draw it's like a 3D printer but you can draw with your hand. Mm-hmm. Okay. I've never seen before, but like if you, like let's say if you wanted to draw, I don't know, some shower curtains instead of buying something, you could just 
do it. Oh yeah, That's I mean, so cool. I mean, without that, you have no need to go get money. So then that frees up yeah. all your time yeah. to focus on your own endeavors or creative, yeah, uh, asp- uh, aspirations. This, there's, this is sounding all very Black Mirror esque now, but there's going to be a time where that's going to be real because we're just going to live in a virtual world where we can just draw stuff with a virtual pencil and it won't matter what our bodies are doing. It's like the <laughs> Star Star Trek replicator. I don't. Oh, I don't Star Trek. Or um, the Orville. They have the oh, okay. food replicator. Something I think about so much is the movie Wally guessed it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Wally. Yeah. No, yeah, yes. At the end of Wally, the whole the whole concept is a hey, the computer's gonna take over and we're gonna be sitting on the couches. Mm-hmm. That's exactly what I'd be doing. <laughs> I'd be sitting on the couch ordering Uber Eats, <laughs> sitting on the couch, uh watching TV on the computer, on my phone, and it was mm-hmm. like hey, Screens. That was right. So, and um, I work at an airport that is right beside a landfill. And we moved to Michigan six months ago, and so I've been at the new job about six months. And the the mountain of trash has grown about uh, two or three feet since I've been here. So it's wow. like, yeah, uh, that part of Wally is also true. Wow, <laughs> that's crazy. That's so crazy. Who wrote that movie? They was on to something. Oh, it was somebody that just did an episode that we did. Hold on. Let me look it up. Did you, uh, do, do you all both still live in Orlando? No, we're no, in Michigan now. Yeah, Michigan. Oh, what city? Detroit. Oh, okay. Great, great, great. great. Yeah, like yeah. 15 minutes from Detroit. The name is Melvindale, but Detroit okay. is the best. Y'all go to Independence Comedy Club? No, Not I've yet. never heard of it. Yeah, it's a it's a it's a new club out there called Independence Comedy Club that I know a lot of people who have been going through there. So yeah, heard it's great. Yeah, that, but uh, that while that uh, yeah, it's so crazy, man. It's so crazy. It's really weird how they tell you what's gonna happen, then it happens. <laughs> the guy, nice. the guy who wrote it was a director of one of the Simpsons episodes we just did. Oh, okay. really? Yeah, he okay. also wrote uh, Ralph Breaks the Internet. I haven't oh, watched nice. it. I haven't seen that. Um, so you you said that uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, you had just quit your job, and or you had quit your job right before the pandemic started. Yeah. Uh, another Atlanta comic, uh, Joe Pettis, had just, yeah. purchased, just purchased a house when the pandemic happened. And it's like, oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> so... Uh, we got to meet, uh, we met Joe Pettis. Um, I edit, uh, Tots with Ross and, uh, Joe and, and Ross are pretty good friends. Uh, and I met Joe at a underpants, uh, show that Ross yeah. was doing. Uh, and then we met Ian a bear also at the Orlando Indie Comedy Festival. Yeah. Yeah. So if, if they, if they tore down Stone Mountain and, and replaced it with a Mount Rushmore <laughs> of Atlanta comedians, uh, there's. Uh, the Mandalorian, which is Mando and Ian Abair and Joe Pettis. Who's the fourth head on the Atlanta comedy Mount Rushmore? It's interesting too because I thought you was gonna ask me who would my Mount Rushmore be, <laughs> and so now I went from sports four spots to one. <laughs> I think I think you gotta go with Clayton English. Okay, I'm not familiar with him. Clayton English. What, what kind of uh, what kind of comedy styles he got? He he is he won the last last comic standing. Oh okay. wow! Yeah, so the last last comic standing he <clears throat> he was the last winner, and um he's a local comic who he was actually on um y'all watch Hawkeye? Yes. yes. He was the guy who uh, did the LARPing. Okay, awesome. <laughs> the dude he got cool with who did the LARPing. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. That's awesome. That's him. Okay. All right. Well, let's get let's go ahead. Uh, since since I put that in your head, uh, who who would be your your Mount Rushmore? 
but now it feels like it's a slight towards them. <laughs> I'm not. No, 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 no. I'm yeah, not I mean, rebooting. there's there's the 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 up and coming greats, and up and coming greats, but like all time is, is there. So all time Mount Rushmore. So, and this is only from people I've seen live. I'm pretty sure there's people before me. So I would have to go Clayton. Dang, this is kind of hard. Now. <laughs> Clayton, probably, probably, who else is a, it, people who, okay, Bruce Bruce. Bruce Bruce is from Atlanta? Yeah, Bruce Bruce. I didn't know that. that was, he, before I started getting into comedy, he was one of my favorite, like, I love Bruce Bruce, period, end of story. I had no idea he was from Atlanta. That makes so much sense now. Yeah. Bruce Bruce is from oh. there. Uh so- Earthquake is from D.C., but he used to own a club in Atlanta for a long time. Also love him. Earthquake. <clears throat> Have you seen his episode of Always Sunny in Philadelphia? You know something? I don't remember it, but I've seen every episode of Always Sunny <laughs> three times. What it's, episode was it? It's the Gang Breaks D. It's probably... it's. It, uh, it's, I think Is Always it, Sunny like, might be my favorite comedy show, and that's definitely in my top crack? five. I'm sorry? Was the one she was on crack? No, the yeah. one where they where she's do, touring stand-up, and she they fake her being on a late-night show, and Earthquake is like, oh. she's opening for Earthquake at one point. Yeah, I do remember that. Hey, that's... I didn't even think about that. That is him. <laughs> You know, it's interesting about <clears throat> the Always Sunny is the best show I've ever it's seen. So it's so good. We did we did an episode about Always Sunny with Will Blaylock and it was so good. I'm a huge Will Blaylock fan. He's so funny. I'm a, like an uncomfortable amount. <laughs> <laughs> I like I tune in to every Facebook post. <laughs> I'm a huge it's always rich. good. It's kind of weird. Like, I'm a huge fan of him. I think he's one of the best I've ever seen. So funny. And so, so natural. Like, just talking to him is just, it's popping off all the time. Hilarious. That cat is that cat is very, very good at being, at attempting to make people laugh. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it's a lot of Atlanta greats. I feel like, I, I feel like, I, every, now that I'm saying it, I feel like I want to switch people out. <laughs> um, That's, I get it. So, Michael um, Rowland is there too. Michael Rowland is also one of my favorites. Yeah, there's something um, like we knew it, but we didn't realize it. Like we we came up to Atlanta to visit uh, some some people. We we both have family in the area, and we stopped in to um, Vortex. Um, uh, what's the comedy show behind Laughing Vortex? Skull? Laughing, Laughing Skull. Skull. Yeah, we saw Mandel there, didn't we? Yep. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, did. We, I was happy to see y'all. Yep. Uh, and then we went across the street to, uh, it's now closed, but it was the five star. I, or, I, I don't, it was the one that somebody had a show at like 1 a.m. And it was like this labyrinth, gigantic place that. Smith Old Bar. Yes, yep. Smith Old Bar, yes. I used to and, co-host that, yeah. And so we're there and um, like we, we know everything that was in Atlanta, but then when like we were kind of had the the bubbles it's like oh here's the people that are in film in atlanta here's the people that are in cartoons in atlanta and here's the people that are in comedy and then we were at a show and it's like oh here's this guy that writes on comedy central or um on cartoon network he's coming to the stage it's like there's a huge pool of talent in atlanta um like every marvel like most of the marvel films are filmed there the walking dead was filmed there um it's it's ju- it's growing it's been growing for 20 30 years now into this yeah. huge mega complex of entertainment so the fact that you're one of the people that stand out is absolutely crazy and amazing and you stick out for all the good reasons and it's amazing man. to watch you on stage and it's so much fun man thank you i i really appreciate that i i honestly i um I appreciate that a lot. I don't, I, to be honest, I don't think I measure up to half of the great comics in Atlanta. Well, um, 
I honestly think you have the best opener I've ever seen on stage. Oh, thank you. It thank is you. a guaranteed crowd pleaser every single time. And the thing about it is it's like nonsensical. So nobody ever knows what's coming out of your mouth. And it's, it's the best, like chaotic shit like that makes me laugh so much. Hey, I appreciate that so much. I mean, I mean, I, I, I mean, I'm really thankful for um, coming out of here. I do think that, you know, we still have a little ways to go on getting visibility to Atlanta. Mm-hmm. I feel like a lot of times, like, it's a, a like, you'll, you'll see, like, people from, like, 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 most of the industry is still in LA and New York. Mm-hmm. And most people who get, like, picked up for things will be seen in LA and New York. And, um, I mean, and I mean, but the talent, I think it's really grown. And a lot of that is Honestly, a lot of that is due to some of the people from Florida who moved to Atlanta. Some of the people who moved from North Carolina and different places like that. So now, you know, most comics, if they start in other things, they either move here or Nashville. Mm-hmm. Um, it's been helping people grow. So I, yeah. I'm just, you know, I just, I'm just happy to be a part of this scene, and hopefully, you know, we can get some more opportunities for people out here. Okay, so, I also want to ask about your nickname. Because, yeah. like, I've picked up on context clues, and I think it might have something to do with man sandals. Mandel means man sandal. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. That's all it is. That's where it begins. <laughs> People want it to be more than that, but that's what it is. And did you Mandel give the nickname to yourself, or did someone else give it to you? I had, I got it, it's kind of 50-50. But I got it maybe, like, senior year of high school, it spread through college, but Mandel definitely means man sandal. <laughs> um, people wanted to be more entertaining than that. For a while, I was doing this thing where I made it an acronym, which <laughs> is Man Against Negativity Distributing All Love. And I had decided that when I come on stage, I wanted hosts to say that whole thing, <laughs> but they kept refusing to. So. <laughs> People, people don't follow my request, man. I gotta get, I gotta get bigger so people can come. <laughs> Do you think we did the thing, Mickey? I think we covered most of everything. Yeah, I mean, it hey. was a lo- eleven minute episode. <laughs> hey, thank y'all for having me. Thank you for, thank you for being on the show. If people want to keep up with you, where can they like look for you on the internet? Yeah. Yeah, I'm on. I have an Instagram, uh, the Mandelman, T H E M A N D A L M A N. Uh, you know, we have I post clips every now and then or whatever I decide to post. <laughs> I have a podcast as well that's all about Samuel Jackson. Uh, <laughs> we review Samuel Jackson movies. Um, yeah, um, you know, I'm around. What's the name of your podcast? What is the name of that podcast? <laughs> <laughs> I think it's the, the the Sam. I think it's the Sam. Oh, the Mother Effing Podcast. <laughs> that makes sense. That makes yeah. sense. So uh, check that out on YouTube and and Apple Apple Podcasts, whatever they do the stuff. <laughs> and um, yeah, that's pretty much where I'm at. All right. All right. Yeah. Well, I guess I say thank you all for listening, and uh, we'll see you in a couple weeks. What just happened?